just with reference to my qualifications, maybe on a lighter, lighter note, um, as was pointed out, I'm a CFA chart holder, and that um, stands for Chartered Financial Analyst, and it's the benchmark qualification for investments. It's a US qualification, um, and it's the absolute benchmark in the world when it comes to investments. But my, my undergrad training is actuarial science, and when I worked at Old Mutual, the standing joke was always that CFA, which is now the competing qualification, stands for can't face actuarial or couldn't finish actuarial. <laughs> so, um, yeah, one must always know your, know your match. Uh, but anyway, um, thank you very much for the, the opportunity to present. I'll, I'll try and stick to the 20 minutes um, that was allocated. Um, I've been asked to present on economics and markets as an overview, and I've taken a very specific kind of approach to it, um, being one of just standing back a bit and maybe looking very high level and maybe over longer periods of time at what has been going on in the world um, over the last decade or so or since the financial crisis. Because I think we get caught up so easily in the day-to-day -day things about, um, as Lawrence was saying, whether things are green today and red today um, and whether American job numbers are up this week or down this week and what the possible consequences of that that's going to be. Um, but I think to get the interpretation right of what's been going on in the markets over the last number of years, one really just needs to get your, your, your hand or your, your mind around the, the big things that's going on. And that really tells the story, and the rest of it is detail. So we start looking at economic growth in the world. And we had, time goes quickly, we had a financial crisis in 2007, 2008. Um, and it's almost time, 10 years on now, it feels like yesterday. To, to most of us involved in the industry, but you know, it's, it's almost 10 years since. Um, and what happened? So this is looking at economic growth in the US, which is the biggest economy in the world. Still, it was trotting along over time. Then the financial crisis happened, and they had a significant recession. And they started stimulating aggressively to try and get the economy going again. And that stimulation was through lower interest rates, slashing interest rates, monetary policy, unconventional policy that hasn't been tested before, uh, quantitative easing, the most prominent of that. And it comes in different guises, and it was done over different rolling periods and different sizes of it. But at the end of the day, what they tried to do was they were buying bonds, long bonds, predominantly to try and push down long-term interest rates um, because that is hopefully what will kickstart the economy when rates are low and people can start borrowing and people aren't too stretched balance sheet wise and things can get going again. And you combine that with, with low conventional short-term interest rates. So they, they stimulated aggressively and they came out of recession and they started growing again and that's what we've been experiencing over the last number of years. Now they haven't grown kind of all, all engines firing but they've been growing and they haven't been falling back into a recession. That's the most important point. So there's been ups and downs and now and then people got worried, but they didn't have a recurrence of the, of the recession that they experienced. And I think the one thing, you, you can say what you want about the Americans and everyone kind of loves to hate the Americans, but they are a, a very industrious nation and they, they make mistakes and they make big mistakes sometimes. But the other thing you can say about them is if they see that the pawpaw is now going to hit the fan, they act, and they act decisively and quickly, often. So the, the measures they took, or the stimulation that happened here, was really uncharted. Ben Bernanke, um, and, and I'm a big fan of Ben Bernanke, he was a student of the Great Depression. Um, he's an expert on the Great Depression of the 1940s, um, 30s and 40s, and 20s and 30s. <laughs> Um, and, and he critically understood the mistakes or the actions that were taken at the time and, the, and, his, and his view of the mistakes that were, that were made. And he was, um, he was hell-bent in, in avoiding those. And I think he was the right guy uh, at the right time uh, in, in this situation. So the reason why I start with America and, and have taken quite a bit of time to speak about that um, is because as we discuss the other countries in the world, the one thing that you need to remember is the financial crisis was, I wouldn't say it was clearly, Europe has now shown us that it wasn't a 
a U.S. crisis only. It was a global crisis, but it almost kind of started there, and they went into recession first, and they started stimulating first, and therefore they recovered first, and everyone after that is following. So Europe started stimulating after that, the rest of the world, Japan and whoever started stimulating after that. Europe is still aggressively stimulating. We'll talk a bit about that as well. But the important point is from a market's point of view, because America was kind of leading the cycle down and out of it, their markets also discounted the improvement and the stimulus and the, um, and the improving economic conditions that's going to happen. So their share market, for example, have already given fairly good returns, whereas the returns that we're seeing now coming strongly out of different or other pockets in the world are really catching up with that, if you can put it that way. So I want you to have that picture in your mind about America kind of leading into recession, stimulating and out of it, and their market discounting that. This is Europe. So the first few slides are, are economic growth, and, and I promise I'm going to go, you know, after the scene setting, it'll go a lot quicker through the rest of it. This is European economic growth. And as you can see, similar to the U.S., these are mature economies. They don't grow at double digits like Southeast Asia in the heydays and China does. They, they grow, but they grow at kind of lowish single multiples um, as mature economies. They had a severe recession after the financial crisis. They came out of it. But as we know, because of the structural problems in Europe, um, which really is significant, they actually fell back into a second recession. So whereas the U.S. kept on going through aggressive stimulus um, and adjustment to the economies, the Europeans, through political and structural problematique, if you can put it that way, really couldn't get their act together as a as a summary, and fell back into a recession and then came out of it. And as we stand now, they are still or are now aggressively stimulating. And what do we mean by aggressively stimulating? They are buying, for the next 18 months, the European Central Bank is buying a trillion euro worth of bonds to try and push um, long-term interest rates down with the same intention, so that the real economy will start operating more normally uh, because of the benefit of low interest rates. I don't want to spend too much time on it, but the problems in Europe is structural um, to a large extent, and they need to fix the structural problems as well, and that um, still kind of lies ahead of them. This is China's growth rate. So I've, I've covered the US, Europe, and I'm just going to cover China as a proxy for emerging markets. Before the financial crisis, China was growing at kind of high single or sometimes even double digits. They had really go-go years leading up to the financial crisis where everyone got used to them growing at low double-digit growth rates. So compare 10, 11, 12% uh, percent economic growth per annum to the three and four that you get in the US and the really two and three that you used to in South Africa. It's multiples of that. Um, maybe it got a bit overheated. They also suffered a financial, well, the, the, the recession that followed the financial crisis, but in their case, that meant economic growth falling to positive 6%, whereas in other countries, it fell to minus 4%. So it's, it's a fall, but it's technically, I suppose, not a recession, uh, because they still grow, grew positively. Came out of it, um, and then over the last number of years, had positive economic growth, but really downward trending. And the big reason for that, that before the financial crisis, the Chinese economy was heavily export dependent um, by structure. And what they want to do is they want to rebalance the economy or change the structure of it to become more internal consumption orientated, or at least more balanced. Um, and they are on record, they being the ruling party, um, because it's a communist country, it's a, fairly it's a very directly controlled economy, um, and they are on record as saying they are prepared to accept the shorter term pain by way of lower economic growth to get the structural imbalances um, in the economy right for the longer term. So Keep that in mind, because I'm going to show you a few slides forward, the commodity cycle, or what commodities have done. And commodities have exactly mirrored that. 
because China is a major consumer of industrial commodities. And what happened to commodities is really just a reflection um, of this. And as I say, all these things that I'm saying are really the high-level summaries. It's not the granular detail of what platinum did versus palladium versus aluminium, but it is, you, you get the broader trend. But China is growing at 7.5%, and 7.5% is actually the number that they've put down as a number that they are comfortable with. And keep in mind that it is at least double what the rest of the world's growing and what the US is growing. So it remains significant. So I've already kind of touched on this, but what do you do as a central bank um, if your economy is in trouble, like after the financial crisis or in recession? The one thing that you do is you slash interest rates. And this shows interest rates for a number of currencies. It is the US, Japan, Britain, Eurozone, Swiss, Switzerland, um, Scandinavia, um, and Sweden, or Denmark and Sweden. Um, and it's one month, uh, one month LIBOR rates, but it's really just a proxy for short-term interest rates. So think of this as benchmark or a proxy for benchmark interest rates. And the important point is they had positive high-ish single-digit interest rates before the financial crisis. And in order to keep the or to get the economies going and out of recession, they basically just slashed that to near zero after the financial crisis to make money as cheap as possible to try and say to the economy and companies, well, we know you're in trouble. If you want to borrow to keep people so that you don't have to retrench them, if you need to borrow because you need to do capital expenditure, go about your business, we'll try and help you by keeping interest rates as low as possible. That's what they're trying to say. In certain cases, and I don't want to make a long explanation about it, but in certain cases, interest rates are going negative now. So in theory, you're putting money in the bank and they're giving you less money back just for the privilege of leaving your money with them in Switzerland or Scandinavia. Now, there's, you know, there's technicalities around that, but the point is, basically, interest rates are very low to zero um, in, um, in Europe specifically. Uh, but even in the US, it's a quarter percent. You remember I, I mentioned... The, the fact that the U.S. led and the rest are following. And the other important thing is, because of that economic growth we saw from the U.S., the next thing that's going to happen in the U.S. is their interest rates need to go up. But the U.S. Federal Reserve that control their interest rates have the attitude of saying, we will look at the data that comes in and we will base our decisions on that. So they are giving very good guidance to the market. They don't want to surprise the market. Every quarter they meet, um, after every second meeting there's a press conference where they explain how they see the world, they put certain documentation out that the market can refer to, and all of that is intended to give guidance to the market um, as to how they see things develop. Um, things mean, meaning inflation, job numbers, economic growth, uh, and ultimately what they'll do with interest rates. But the point is the Fed is not taking the attitude of saying, here's a stake in the ground, um, come hell or high water, interest rates are going up in March 2015 or whatever. They are taking the attitude of saying, um, we will assess the data as it comes in, and based on that, um, we realize interest rates need to start rising as the economy recovers so that the inflation ultimately don't become a problem, um, but we will do it in an in a organized way. Consensus was, last year, that American interest rates will start going up first or second quarter of this year. That's now rolled forward in terms of market consensus towards the end of this year. So towards the end of this year, rates will start going up. And remember, their base rate is a quarter percent, 0.25 percent. In a normalized world, over the long term, the Fed wants American interest rates at 4 percent, and they want their inflation at 2 percent. So they need to go from a quarter percent to 4 percent. That's going to take quite a while. So for a while still, there's going to be the situation of low rates and a lot of money in the system supporting asset classes. What, what does low interest rates mean for investment markets or asset classes? If you invest in something, you compare what you can invest in in front of you here now to the alternatives. So the one alternative is you can leave your money in the bank and earn nothing on it. Or the next alternative is you can invest in property. Or the next alternative is you can invest in equity, um, in, in shares. 
Now, shares, for example, come with more risk because you're exposed to companies, management can be good or bad, um, you know, different things can happen to companies, so there's more risk there than there is in lending money to a government, for example, and you want to be rewarded for that risk. But overall, you just want to compare opportunities against each other. So you want to know what share is likely to give me compared to this very low, almost zero, interest rate that I have to accept if I have money in the bank, if I'm an overseas investor. Um, so it's partly through the result of these low interest rates that equities and markets have done well over the last number of years. That's really the point I want to make, because that's one of the alternative assets, and more and more people, and continually so over the last number of years, investors look at that, this and said, well, I'll rather take my chance on equities than accept this, the interest rate that I know is not growing and it's close to zero and it's not tax efficient. Um, let's rather take a chance on the markets. That's effectively the bottom line uh, of what has happened in markets. And I'll, I'll, show you, I'll show the market graphs to you just to make the point. Briefly, a, a comment on commodities. And I just show copper um, as a proxy, really. It's an industrial commodity, so it's something that you use to make things. Um, and therefore, China is a consumer of this, and therefore it's a, a good proxy. And you remember I said when I looked at the China graph, remember how their economic growth kind of went just kind of not dramatic falling, but trending downwards over the last number of years as they've been adjusting the, the economy. Commodities as proxied here by copper really just did exactly the same thing. And it was obviously bad for the people who produce copper and export it, countries like South Africa, um, other commodity exporters, because they felt the effect of this weaker demand um, coming from, from China. And we've been in this downward commodity cycle for the last three, four years after the improvement that we saw post the financial crisis. After the financial crisis and the, the global recession, for a period of time, oil really went sideways, and then there was this precipitous collapse in the oil price last year. What was the reason for this? Economic on the one hand, so slowing in China, slowing in, Euro in Europe, more economic trouble in Europe, but also the supply dynamics. So what, happens in, what happened in Saudi Arabia, um, and you might have read this or, or be aware of it, but in the past, the Saudis would have turned off the, the, the pumps or the, the oil production um, to defend the price of oil. Whereas last year, they took the stance that they are going to keep on producing because they want to protect the market share of the energy market or oil market as opposed to defend the price. Now, why would they do that? Um, it's also interesting, and one can talk a lot about it. The one argument is they've got deep pockets, so they wanted to squeeze the American shale gas guys out of the system, effectively. And to a large extent, that was, that was um, successful. So a lot of shale gas production in the US shut down because it became uneconomical. So there are, I suppose, pure economic or market competitive arguments as to what the Saudis did and why they did it and whether it was successful or not. Um, it's recovered a bit. Alternative, I like to say, and I suppose I'll be proven right or wrong in, in time, Alternative energy sources is a reality. 20 years ago, if you spoke about wind or solar or something else, people would laugh you out of the room. But I don't know whether you follow kind of the popular science uh, publications, but I'm sure you might know about the Tesla battery system that they are developing. Tesla is the, the local boy, Elon Musk from Pretoria Boys High, who started building electric cars and space rockets in the US. Uh, and he's an amazing entrepreneur and businessman. Um, they build electrical cars and now they're starting to build batteries for home use that effectively can take your house off the grid, so efficient those batteries are. Um, so these things are becoming realities and um, I went to do a presentation the other day, sorry this point is really about a bit of good news about South Africa, we easily get depressed about South Africa, but the other day I went to do a presentation and we, it was in Hartswater and we went past, I think it was Jan Kemsdorp, and there is a massive solar farm there that I actually read about first in an international publication. Before I read it in any South African publication, 
I read about this thing, so when we, when we drove there, we looked out for it. There is a massive, massive, massive solar farm outside Young Kemdorp selling solar energy to the, to the SA grid. Um, you know, in my view, I'm, a, I'm more of an SA optimist than a pessimist. In my view, that's, that's the kind of stories we need to read in the paper as opposed to all the other stuff. So anyway, uh, uh, that's a bit of a aside. Uh, back to oil. Is a falling oil price or a lower oil price good or bad for the world on average? That was also a big debate last year. It's obviously bad for people who export oil, and lower commodity prices are bad for people that export commodities. But on average, the consensus is that a lower and stable oil price is actually good for the world economy, because there are lots of consumers. And as the one commentator kind of facetiously said, um, is it such a bad thing if money gets transferred from the deep pockets of the Saudis to your pocket as a consumer uh, of petroleum and oil? Uh, maybe that's not the, the worst thing that can happen. Just to make the point that inflation is low in the world. Um, there are no inflation problems now and then in the emerging world a bit, but in the developed world, currently there's no inflation problems. This is US inflation, core inflation, it's at 1.5%, 1 1.6%, 1 1.7%. 2% is the inflation rate that they are prepared to tolerate in the US. You don't want no inflation in the economy either, because then there's no pricing power. Um, you want stable, low but stable inflation. Um, so they want positive inflation, um, and 2% is the level at which they're prepared to, to tolerate it. So there's no specific problem there. Um, this is euro inflation. They effectively are panicking a bit because they're staring deflation in the face. Their inflation rate is 0.5, I think it is. So much lower than what it's been in the past. Um, and deflation actually becomes an economic problem, as I just mentioned now. Because if you're a company and there's no inflation, it means people will postpone buying your products because they know in a month's time they'll buy it cheaper. So that doesn't make for good economic um, kind of working of the system. If there's, if there's no inflation. So that's why they're trying to, I wouldn't say they're specifically trying to get inflation up, but they're trying to stimulate the economy also to, to correct this. So let's turn to markets, and I'm almost done. Just to give you the sense that, and that's really the, the main point of, of the whole presentation. We had a financial crisis and a recession. We had stimulation after that. And stimulation means low interest rates, which forces investors to other asset classes because money in the bank is not an option. Um, and this has been the result in markets. So against a backdrop, if you just think about what your gut feel says about the world economy and any economy really over the last decade or five years or so, it's an unsettling feeling. One, one doesn't have the gut feel that economically things have been going great. But the markets have pumped. And that's because of this explanation I gave of low rates forcing people to, to alternative asset classes. And, and, and also, as capitalists, we should say it's a bet on improvement in the future. It's a bet on the fact that the world is not going to fall into a, in a heap of despair forever. Because the market is a forward-looking mechanism. So it looks at the economic policies that are now being implemented, the low rates, the stimulation, the structural reforms, and it rewards that. So it discounts it. Um, and that's partly also where the, growth, the, the economic growth came from. So this is the US, the Dow, just as an example, it went from, I think that's 8,000 to 18,000 um, after the financial crisis. This is the Euro, as I mentioned, the fortunes of the euro area was a bit more mixed than the US um, since the recession. And for a long time, the market kind of really didn't go anywhere. It's only in this period where we saw more aggressive stimulation um, that the market really started moving. And this is South Africa. So there's our financial crisis, very strong economic growth um, in the period since. And our all share went from 20,000 to 55,000. And one can again, I suppose, speak for a long time about why did we do so well. Um, but it has to do with 
international investors chasing returns. Maybe more, it's easier to see it on our bond, on our bond side. Um, I'll, I'll conclude with a, a few valuation graphs. Um, our bond yields still offer decent returns relative to that of the rest of the world. So that's why foreigners want to invest in our bonds um, and still attracts that. And the same on our equity side. Our industrial companies have done very well because global investors look at our market and compare Mr. Price to a retailer in Indonesia. Uh, and even as Mr. Price goes up and up and up, if it gets to a PE of 20 or 30, as long as those, that PE is lower than the comparative Indonesian retailer PE, it still looks like a good bet. So we've seen significant inflow of foreign investors into our industrial shares specifically, um, not necessarily our commodity shares. This slide just shows returns over the last one, well, the quarter, first quarter of this year, and the last year to the end of March. So it's the short-term period, and it looks at um, Japan, the S&P, that's America, the U.S., developed markets in general, Europe, uh, Asia, and emerging markets. And it's really to make the point that I've made on the previous slides as well, that the best returns of the short term have come out of the geographies where there's been aggressive stimulation recently. So they are now on the stimulatory footing, uh, whereas the U.S. have already done that. So their returns are already kind of tapering off a bit because they passed the point of maximum um, stimulation. This looks at the valuation of asset classes, and this is for South Africa, and it's a yield comparison. I don't want to make it too complicated. Think of it this way. This compares the yield of every asset class to its own long-term yield. <clears throat> so think of it this way. If you want to buy a house to rent out, and currently, or on average, in the last 10 years, you could get 20,000 rand rent a month, if you can now buy a house and you can get 40,000 rand rent a month instead of 20, you would think it's a good deal because 40 is higher than 20. So you make the conclusion that there's um, good opportunity in buying that asset. This looks exactly the same. So that rent I'm talking about is the yield that the house pays you. And every asset class has a yield. For equity, it's an earnings yield or the earnings of the company. For property, it's the, the, the predominantly the rental yield. Um, for bonds, it's the interest that it pays you, so that's, that's the yield. And these bullet points are the long-term yields over time above inflation that you expect from an from asset class. The bars show you what the yield is currently. So in my example, I said currently if you can get 40 instead of 20, it's a good, it's a good investment. The problem on this slide clearly is that all the current yields for ESA asset classes are below the long-term yields. So the unfortunate conclusion is no asset class in South Africa on a standalone basis are really cheap compared to its own history. Equities and property particularly so, bonds a bit better value, um, but none of them really cheap. What one can do is one can expand this to the rest of the world. This is all the equity markets, and it's a bit blurry, but all of them are listed there. These are the equities, these are the fixed incomes, the red bars are again the South African bars. And there's a few interesting things to say about this slide. Our bonds, although they're expensive compared to their own history, still give you a much better return than any of the other bonds in the world. So that explains why foreigners still want to buy our bonds. Unfortunately, on the equity side, our equity market is not only expensive relative to its own long-term yield history, but it's also expensive compared to most other countries in the world. And that's why in portfolios of clients that we consult to and in our own products, we have the maximum foreign exposure that we can have per mandate. Um, and we are underweight South African equities because it actually does look uh, a bit expensive. One obviously needs to look at the sector, level, sector levels as well, um, but overall the market um, is not cheap. These Next few slides, just look at the emerging market complex. So it speaks a bit to, um, to Fungai's presentation as well. And without giving too much of the detail, it's really just to make the point that there are many other emerging markets, the likes of Russia, China, Brazil, that are much cheaper than what South Africa currently is. There's price to book on this axis and um, 
price to sales on that axis. That's the cheap side of the equation. South Africa, not that cheap anymore. Um, and the same when we look at forward PE on this axis and dividend yield on that axis. The cheap opportunities in the emerging markets are in China, Russia, um, Brazil, uh, and some of the other prominent European and, and Asian um, economies. The more expensive ones are SA, Indonesia, Philippines, um, Mexico, and the likes. So where we do have emerging market exposure, we favor a manager like the Coron Coronation uh, Global Emerging Markets Fund that captures some Russia, Brazil, and um, uh, and China exposure. Sorry, that's the one I forgot. <laughs> um, just for interest, and I'll, I think I'll almost stop here, the Chinese equity market did 100% last year. I'm not sure whether you're aware of it, but it did basically 100%. So people ask, is China now expensive um, because it's done so well? This slide tries to answer that, and what it does is it overlays the current bull market in China, which is the blue line, with the previous bull market, which is the period 2002 to 2007, so pre the financial crisis, and that's the red line. And it looks at the market returns themselves, and it looks at the PE ratios that are the valuations. And on both of them, although the Chinese market has already given that 100% return last year, it is not nearly as expensive or as overheated as what it became at the end of the previous bull market. So this is really just to explain we still have a China exposure in our portfolios, and it's based on the fact that the valuations and the market levels are not nearly as expensive yet as what it got to um, at the end or at the peak of the previous bull market. So how are our portfolios positioned, or what's our high and medium and low conviction ideas? And these ideas also um, get presented in the client portfolios where we consult, we propose it, and we discuss it, and, and um, decisions get taken about it. These are high conviction ideas. Africa and emerging market property, Chinese equity, general emerging market equity, African equities, European equities because of the recovery story, um, and Japanese equities based on valuations and the aggressive stimulation that they're currently doing. Neutral conviction ideas, the stuff that we want neutral exposures to, so some exposure but not too much. Developed world equities, predominantly the U.S., because they've already done well and are leading the pack and have discounted a lot of the good news. We want some exposure, but we don't want massive overweight exposures. Developed world property and SA fixed income, because our yields are still 7, 8. Overseas yields are low. There's good support for our, for our fixed income. Low conviction ideas, the stuff that we want little of or underweight positions. SA equities, because it's quite expensive, local listed property, um, and offshore fixed income, that zero yielding instruments that I showed on the, one of the previous graphs. But the, the big picture I wanted to leave you, you with were, we had a financial crisis, there were lots of stimulus, the US led, the rest of the world's following, the US markets have already done well because they led through the recovery, Europe and Japan, and China or the emerging world will be following. Asset prices, alternative to low yielding fixed income asset losses, were the big beneficiaries over the last number of years. That is property and equity. So we see a situation where we had phenomenal equity markets against the backdrop of pretty poor economic conditions. Um, and I hope I illustrated why that happens. It happens because the market looks forward and is optimistic if you're a capitalist. And it also happens because there's all this money in the system and rates are so low, but no one wants to leave their money in the bank, so they start looking at, at alternatives. And they convince themselves that it's a better idea to buy a high yielding asset, a company that pays dividends or property that gives you a rent, as opposed to uh, very low rates in, in the bank. Thank you very much. <laughs>